welcome to our final unit of U.S. History B, and we call this one Modernizing America. By and large, with Modernizing America, we have the growth of cities, and we have the concept of the progressive era and progressive politics. So we get things kicked off with immigration. Now the first wave, we could say, of immigration mainly came from Northern and Central Europe. And we have three nations we're predominantly looking at. You can kind of see them here. Even though this says English, we can say Great Britain, you know, men like Andrew Carnegie from Scotland. Uh, we had immigration from Ireland and Germany, like Karl Schurz. And you can kind of get an idea of when each group came in the different waves. The first wave comes from England. But advances in wages and living conditions eliminated many of the push factors. So there were only 2.7 million that came from Britain in the years 1820 to 1890. About 780,000 Irish arrived from 1841 to 1850 alone. And this is mainly due to the failure of the main crop, the potato. This is the Irish potato famine. And another 914,000 came from 1851 to 1860. Overall, in 1820 to 1890, about three and a half million arrived. There were even more Irish in America than in Ireland, and more Irish in New York City than in Dublin. Now, when you look at the trends of overall immigration, most came as single males to earn money and establish residence until they could afford passage for their families. But the Irish came as families, and in the initial wave, more than 20% died en route. Now, there were few opportunities for Irish women back home, so for a time, the number of Irish women outnumbered the men, which was quite unusual, and they often found work as maids. The Irish welcomed the chance to be part of a power structure due to decades of oppression by the British. So they entered the police and fire brigades, they voted as a bloc, for the Democrats, and eventually came to be a controlling political force in New York and Boston. You know, the economic and social disruption that had sent millions to America's shores are going to fade by the end of the 1800s. Many Germans fled their lands after the failed 1848 democratic revolutions in Europe, and many also came after some impressive crop failures, although not as bad as the Irish potato famine. In the 1850s, about 941,000 came, and overall, from 1820 to 1890, the so-called German states sent about 4.5 million. It's very tough to determine exactly who was German because they didn't become a unified state until 1871. Thousands fought in the Civil War, of which General Karl Schurz was the most visible, and after the war, Many combined their previous farming experience with the new Homestead Act to settle in the open areas of the Midwest and the Great Plains. Unlike other groups of unskilled workers, many Germans brought specific skills with them, such as mechanical skills and steelworking skills, and they began to populate cities like Cincinnati, Milwaukee, and St. Louis. Later in the century, uncertainty in Central Europe kind of leveled off, so therefore immigration leveled off. So the mid to late 1800s, this first wave is from Central and Northern Europe. Late 1800s and into the early 1900s, a shift began in the regions that sent immigrants to the U.S. Part of this was because railroads began to reach poorer areas of Europe. So more immigrants from places like Italy could conveniently make the first stage of the passage. An excess of steamships that competed for passengers also drove down the price of a ticket in the 1800s. The ships became more stable and reliable to the point where many sought to earn money and then return home to help out their families. Nearly three times as many Italians as Irish ended up immigrating in 1900, although about half of them did return home. Jews began coming in large numbers in the mid-1800s as they were fleeing the policies of the Russian Tsar, so most were either Russian or Polish. Many came 
from a western region of the empire known as the Pale of Settlement, which was predominantly made up of lower income Jews that weren't allowed to live anywhere else. Pogroms against the Jews intensified in the late 1800s, so those who came had no intention of returning home. Within the small villages of the Pale, culture centered on their communities and the intellectual culture centered in the school, uh, religious schools. Both of these traditions were carried to America. In 1900, Russia sent four times as many immigrants as Germany. And we can see some total numbers here, about 20 million total in these years. Now we've mentioned 1820 to 1890 a number of different times. 1820 is when the government first began to keep immigration statistics. And 1890 is when the federal government first began to regulate immigration. Prior to this, this was a job mainly for state governments. And you kind of get an idea of where different groups are coming from and the fact that it was all state policies. On the East Coast alone in the 1800s, four out of every five immigrants entered the U.S. via New York. And Ellis Island opened in 1892 in New York Harbor to facilitate and process these immigrants. With the Statue of Liberty looming in the background, it served as a symbol of hope for the 12 million immigrants who entered via Ellis Island from 1892 until it formally closed in 1954. Now all of this is taking place on the East Coast. When we shift our focus to the West Coast, it's a dramatically different experience. Thousands of Chinese had emigrated in fleeing the opium wars with Britain and France in the 1840s and the 1850s. Thousands more came to pan for gold in California, and many were still around to be employed as laborers on the Central Pacific Railroad, you know, over 250,000 since the mid-1800s. Native-born workers in California complained for years that Chinese workers drove down wages, and President Chester Arthur responded by signing the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Under this law, students, businessmen, temporary visitors, and spouses could enter, but nobody else could. The new law actually caused a spike in a new type of phenomenon known as illegal immigration. So we have immigrants from China. We also have Japan. And the country of Japan emerged from about 250 years of self-imposed isolation when an American naval commander showed up in the early 1850s to encourage them to open their borders. There was general instability in the decade and a half that followed, in which the ruling Tokugawa family fell and the Meiji Emperor was restored. So many Japanese were fleeing issues from this new Meiji restoration. 180,000 ended up emigrating by 1924, although the 1907 Gentlemen's Agreement between Japan and the U.S. meant that Japan agreed to restrict emigration to the U.S. They would only allow new Japanese to come if they either owned property or already had family in the U.S. And, and this was an informal agreement to be replaced with the Immigration Act of 1924. This set new quotas on immigrants from the Eastern Hemisphere and outright banned immigration from Asia. So when we look at the West Coast, it's predominantly East Asia. All of this leads to the construction of Angel Island, a detention center in San Francisco Bay that opened up in 1910. And it's going to be in operation for about 30 years. This is the point of entry for all prospective immigrants from East Asia. And 18% of all prospective immigrants were actually rejected. One million gained entry during this time. And the detainment, you know, you can see the detained in this image. Detainment while awaiting formal entry could last as little as a few days, could last up to one year, or in one case, as long as 22 months. 